Wow, that was quick. I guess I should turn the microphone off more often. The microphone is still screwed up, the sound is still screwed up, and in fact, I have to physically turn the speakers off, otherwise there's a really obnoxious sound that comes out that's even more obnoxious than me. If it gives you any perspective, okay? So again, if you can't hear me above, give me a holler and I'll try to give you a holler, okay? All right, so we are making our way through protein structure. And when I concluded last time, we ta I was talking about prions, mad cow protein, and so forth. And the question came up about, well, how is it that a protein like a misfolded protein like a prion can actually induce other properly folded proteins or even partially folded proteins to misfold? And as I said at the end of class, we don't fully understand how that happens, but we can envision some ways in which that might happen. Okay? So have you guys given good thought to this? Did anybody give any thought to this? Extra credit, just raise your hand. Nobody wanted extra credit. I was going to give it right there. Okay. All right, so let me just give you a, a scenario. I'm not going to spend much time on it, but one thing that we could think about with this is imagine I have a misfolded protein, and it's got, in this case, that little sort of rectangular structure that we see. That's the wrongly folded protein. It's going to have on its surface an arrangement of amino acids that's different than what this guy has right here, right? But we can imagine that on the surface of this protein we have what kind of amino acids, first of all? Hydrophilic, right? Hydrophilic amino acids because they like water. Hydrophobics on the inside, etc. Okay? We can imagine that on the outside of this guy, if it's misfolded, we might have a little bit of hydrophobic, for example. Right? That's not uncommon. One of the reasons that we have chaperonins, those things that help proteins to fold properly, is they help proteins to fold properly so that they don't coagulate with each other via their hydrophobic amino acids. Now let's imagine, if you will, that I've got a misfolded protein that's got some hydrophobics on the outside that shouldn't be there. And by the way, you know there are some on the outside. It's not absolute, okay? But some things on the outside that aren't normally there. What if this guy right here starts interacting with a protein as it's being made? She says it's going to attract more, okay? Well, what's going to happen as it's being made those hydrophobics have to get put in someplace. They're being put in early. Well, imagine that this guy all of a sudden glums onto them, and now it keeps it from the normal folding that it's going through because now it's got this big honking protein that's sitting next to it, associating with it through hydrophobic interactions between proteins. It's actually physically stopping it from folding the normal way that it would do during the protein synthesis process. That's one way we can envision that a misfolded protein might, in fact, cause other proteins to misfold as well. As I said, it's not fully known, but based on what we know about protein structure just from this class, we could speculate that's not an unreasonable way to think about protein misfolding might occur. Does that make sense? <laughs> Better say yes or he's going to do something, right? Yes, okay. So, um, so that's one. There's others that you can envision. All right? um, it's, as you might imagine, a topic that's very intensely studied. And I'll tell you something else that's very surprising about these misfolded proteins. And it appears to be rather unique to this group of proteins. Okay? One of the things you can think about, and there was a concern years ago um, that there was an incidence, a big incidence of mad cow disease in Great Britain. And they didn't uh, keep it out of the food supply. So cows that had this, they got slaughtered. Their meat got sent off to, to uh, make hamburger and a variety of things. And the thought was, well, it's in the brain, so it's not like it's going to be any big deal, right? We don't want to waste stuff. And then a few years later, they started seeing a higher incidence of human Creutzfeldt-Jakob syndrome. It's the human equivalent. There was concern that perhaps what people were eating was somehow making it into and through their bloodstream and ultimately causing it. Whether it happened or not is another matter. That's, that was controversial, and it still is. But there was indeed a great increase in the human form of this disease. 
And you're sitting here thinking, well, how could that happen? It's hard to imagine how it could happen because it would have to get in the bloodstream and do a variety of things. But we also don't fully know how Creutzfeldt Jacob is transmitted from one human to another. We think it has to involve brain contact. I knew somebody whose uncle was a coroner who died of Creutzfeldt Jacob, and they think it was probably because of him handling somebody who had a brain that had the disease. Kind of a sickening thought, isn't it? So can eating this cause the problem? Well, we don't know. We don't think so, but we don't fully know. And one of the concerns is this. The protein that's misfolded right here is misfolded in an extraordinarily stable form. Most proteins are not very stable to things like heat. Okay? I cook my meat, I'm okay, because I kill all the bacteria in it. I kill all the viruses in it. Okay? I'm amazed at the number of students who eat their, th their stuff well done. Okay? A lot of students eat stuff well done. You know, well done puts all kinds of carcinogens in the meat that you're eating. That's a different matter. But did you know that? I eat my meat rare. Bloodthirsty Ahern, right? Okay. I eat it rare because I don't want all that stuff that's on there as a result of the burning that happens during well done. Making it well done doesn't protect you a whit from mad cow disease, if you get it that way. You know why? Because if you want to denature the protein, that is, make it inactive, the protein that's misfolded, it takes a temperature of 700 degrees Fahrenheit. I kind of doubt you're going to get your well done steak cooked to that level. Okay? It ain't going to happen. So if you're going to get, I'm going to get mad cow with rare, you're going to get it with well done as well. We'll all go cuckoo together, right? <laughs> okay, but it's a concern. It's a real concern. This is a very stable protein, and we don't inactivate it by heating. At least not under regular conditions. It's one of the reasons a lot of people go vegetarian. I'm not advocating that either, but I'm just saying that's something to be thinking about. Okay, so that's mad cow. That's misfolded proteins. Um, I want to just say a, brief, a few brief words about the relationship or some of the ways in which we can disrupt some of the structures in proteins now that we've gone through all of these different proteins. Okay? So, um, one of these is right here. Okay? And that is reducing disulfide bonds. If you recall, I said if we put together two sulfhydryls and we put them into close proximity, they will frequently lose protons, lose electrons, become oxidized, and make a disulfide bond. Right? I also said there's ways we can manipulate that such that we remove that disulfide bond and we can do it chemically in the laboratory if we want to study this. Cells also have ways of reducing that disulfide bond inside of themselves. They have a protein called glutathione. It's a peptide actually, a glutathione that will actually help to reduce a disulfide back to a sulfhydryl if it's, if it's desirable. So what we're seeing here with the chemical treatment also happens at the cellular level that cells do. Here's a protein that's got a disulfide bond. I treat it with a reagent called mercaptoethanol. And mercaptoethanol, as you see, has a sulfhydryl. Basically what mercaptoethanol does is it donates its proton and electrons to this guy so that the pro I'm sorry, to, to this guy so that the protein develops sulfhydryls. And as a result, this guy, having given up its protons and electrons, becomes a disulfide itself. It's sort of swapping disulfides, in a sense. There are other chemical reagents that will do very similar, essentially the same thing. Another one's called dithiothreatol. And I'm not going to spell that. It'll be spelled in the notes. You'll see that in the notes. Okay. Dithiothreatol does exactly the same thing. and has a different starting chemical structure. These sulfurous compounds are really uh, sort of foul smelling, you know, rotten eggs and so forth. This isn't rotten eggs, but it's, it's sort of equivalent. It's got a strong smell to it. It doesn't take very much to get its odor out there. That sulfhydryl really does light up. Dithiothreatol smells quite a bit like skunk, to give you an idea, okay? If you're working in a laboratory with these reagents, everybody knows you're using them. But this way you don't have to wear deodorant either, so <laughs> just think of what you save, right? Okay. Other structure disruptors. So we, we have chemicals that can disrupt sulfhydryls. There are other chemicals that can disrupt hydrogen bonds. And hydrogen bond disruptors include urea, 
Urea is the stuff that, that is in your urine. Okay? It also has a smell of its own. Guanidinium chloride will disrupt hydrogen bonds. So if I wanted to disrupt secondary structure, I would treat with urea, right? Yes, ma'am. Why is it favorable to be breaking disulfide bonds inside of a cell? It may or it may not be. But in some cases, proteins may be activated or inactivated by that. And since cells are control freaks, being able to pull the switch, as it were, gives them more power. Okay. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But it's just important at this point to understand that that is a reversible kind of process. Okay? Okay. Um, so... Urea, guanidine chloride, beta mercaptoethanol, ethanol, of course, disrupts um, sulfhydryl bonds. If we look at, now I want to tell you about an interesting experiment that illustrates all of this stuff. Okay? What you see depicted on the screen schematically is another unusual and interesting and stable enzyme called ribonuclease. Ribonuclease. We call it RNAs. R-N-A-S-E. Ribonuclease destroys RNA. It breaks it down one base at a, in some cases one base at a time, in some cases a bunch of bases at a time. It doesn't really matter. But suffice it to say that it breaks down RNA into nucleotides. RNA tends to be very stable. You're going to think all these protons are very proteins are very stable. In fact, most proteins aren't very stable. So I'm telling you about a couple of interesting examples. Ribonuclease is very stable. I can take ribonuclease and put it in a test tube and I can boil it, okay? And when I cool it back down, I discover, voila, still has ribonuclease activity. If you work in a laboratory that does work with RNA, RNA is your worst nightmare because it's really hard to get rid of. It's kind of like the mad cow protein. You boil it, it doesn't go away, it's still there. And RNA is present in every single thing that you touch cells are loaded with it, you have uh, it in your sweat, you have it in anything. So anything that has ever touched a human hand has RNAs in it. Not good. So if you're working in a lab like this, you have to have some specific inhibitors. You may have to do some very special treatment of your glassware to heat it to a very high temperature, kind of like the, the prion business, before you can destroy its function. Well, the question is, well, why is ribonuclease so stable? Okay. And again, I can't fully tell you the answer, but we do know that it has what appear to be some disulfide bonds that are in critical structural points. Critical structural points. If we look in this auditorium, for example, we see some beams. There's a beam there, there's a beam there, there's a beam there, there. Those aren't just there for decoration. They are actually helping to hold the ceiling up over us, let alone the rest of the building. If I were to remove this beam, my suspicion is that while the ceiling might not come down, it probably would have a greater chance of doing so if I did. So there are some things that are more essential to structure than others. If I were to, for example, remove this front row of seats, it probably wouldn't have a lot of things to do with the structure or the stability of the ceiling, right? Well, RNA probably has these guys in critical places such that when I boil it, remember when I boil it, disulfide bonds are still stable. Things are held into close enough proximity so that this guy can now properly refold. Those hydrogen bonds that were broken can reform, and they didn't go anywhere, they're still there. In most proteins, this doesn't happen. Most proteins do, in fact, have disulfide bonds, but they're not as strategically placed as they are here. Make sense? Okay, now, well, how do I, th there's some interesting things I can do with this, all right? So, what if I take mercaptoethanol and I treat it with, I'm sorry, if I take ribonuclease and I treat it with mercaptoethanol, what's going to happen to those disulfide bonds? They're going to come apart, right? If I do that, and I treat it with mercaptoethanol, I discover that the protein is still active. Okay? That says there's something else that's holding it together, and that's not surprising because you know proteins have various things that help stabilize tertiary structure. Hydrogen bonds, okay, they have hydrophobic bonds, etc., that are helping to hold it together. So that's not surprising. 
But what if I took that thing that had been uh, treated in this way and I either boiled it or I treated it with urea? Now I'm going to destroy the hydrogen bonds. What do you suppose is going to happen to this protein? Well, you can see here, it's going to unfold. Okay? And that's not surprising. That convinces us that, convinces us that those, that merca those uh, disulfide bonds were very important for the structural integrity of this guy. But what if I take that urea away? What happens? With most proteins, even if I take it away, it doesn't come back together properly. It doesn't fold properly. Because folding starts while the protein is being made. And all those confusing things that happen after a protein is made of all the possible interactions that might happen that wouldn't happen while it was being made, all of a sudden are there. The protein gets confused, it doesn't fold properly, and it still stays inactive. However, ribonuclease is different. Ribonuclease, if I take that urea away, will, to a limited extent, refold properly. To a limited extent, it will refold properly. Now, now, that simple experiment tells us something very, very important. It tells us that there's all the information that we need for folding in the sequence. We didn't do anything magic to it. We didn't wave a wand to it. We didn't do anything like that. All we had was that sequence, and that sequence had enough information to fold on its own. No cellular component, no anything else in that tube. Okay? So that's reiterating what I told you earlier. Primary structure dictates all of the other structures. This guy can refold when only the primary structure is there. And it does. Now, I'll tell you something that will surprise you. And that is if we go through and we do this process, and we do it with mercaptoethanol, and we do it w without mercaptoethanol, which one do you suppose gives us more activity? Without, right? Wrong. Oh, man, I knew it was a trick question just by the way he said it, right? No, it doesn't give you more activity. And my question to you is, why? Why would putting a little bit of mercaptoethanol in there give you more activity than having no mercaptoethanol at all? Yes, sir. He hit it right on the nose, OK? If you put mercaptoethanol in there, Folding sometimes can fold wrong. We've already talked about this, right? This can help unfold wrong things and allow them to fold properly. It can also stop this polypeptide over here from making a disulfide with this polypeptide over here so that we have a conglomerate, which isn't going to fold properly either. So a little bit of, disul a little bit of mercaptoethanol in there actually facilitates a larger percentage of the, of the polypeptides folding properly. That's kind of a cool thing. You guys don't look like that's a really cool thing. It's a cool thing. Yes, professor. OK. Questions on that? OK. Let's see. What else did I want to say here? Folding, unfolding, blah, blah. Uh, typing monkeys. We don't need to have typing monkeys. Uh, side chains, chemical rearrangement. OK, I think we're done right there. OK. No, I didn't click on right there where it said song here. OK. We've got important work to do today, folks. Protein characterization, OK? Now that I've just ruined your day, or maybe made your day, I don't know. What I'm going to talk about now are, I started describing to you ways that we could alter proteins. Now I want to tell you about ways that we can purify and or characterize proteins. This is a very important thing. If you work in a biochemistry laboratory, you're going to do some of these things. It's hard to work in a biochem lab and not work with proteins. All right? So it's important that we understand some of the very basic things that are out there for working with proteins. Well, the, any la biochem laboratory you go to, it's almost impossible to find one that doesn't have a centrifuge. Has anybody ever been in a biochem lab that didn't have a centrifuge? No? You started to say yes, and you said no? Well, I thought you were asking if you've ever been to a biochem 
Oh, been to a biochem lab. How many people have been to a biochem lab? Okay. And how many people have been to a biochem lab without a centrifuge? Okay. They go hand in hand. A centrifuge provides centrifugal force, a sort of artificial gravity, as it were, that allows us to separate big things on the basis of centrifugal force. The greater the force, the more we can spin down. We can make it precipitate, as it were. Okay? If I take cells and I take tissue, let's say I'm, just, I'm interested in studying liver, and I take the, that liver and I grind it up, I'm going to have individual cells. It's not going to be there as a, as a liver, but I'm going to have liver cells. I can take and I put that into a low speed centrifuge and I spin it down, what's going to happen? Well, the cells are going to go down and the remaining stuff is going to be floating in the supernatant. And if I take and I use some kind of agitation or mechanical thing that I can bust open those cells and I take that mixture and I spin it down, I'm going to see that I'm going to have membranes and big things like that that are going to... That are Why do you have that on? Are you a surgeon? Okay. So you probably don't need to have it on, do you? Okay. If there are any surgeons in here, let me know, and you can have the, the phone on. Otherwise, you just disturbed everybody else. Okay. Now, you spin it down, and in that case, you bring down membranes. What stays in the liquid part? The stuff that was soluble in the cell, the cytoplasm, things like that. Maybe the organelles, mitochondria, nucleus, etc. Okay? So those um, are things that we can separate on the basis of centrifugal force. We can separate some pretty small things using a centrifuge that might go up to 100,000 times the force of gravity. Okay? Some pretty remarkable stuff. Well, that's fine and dandy. Let's say I'm interested in working with a protein. Proteins are soluble here. I'm not going to spin down a protein unless it's attached to something else. A protein, a soluble protein is going to stay in that supernatant for the most part. Stays in that supernatant, and now I've got my protein, and I've got a bunch of copies of that protein, but oh my god, it's got all this different buffer and all this different mix of stuff that I had in there, all these different salts that I used to precipitate it. Now I need to get rid of the salts. It turns out it's very simple to do. You guys probably did this in basic biology. You dump stuff into a dialysis tube. Dialysis tubing allows small molecules to come out. The big guys don't come out and you see the tube starts swelling. Why does the tube swell? Osmotic pressure, right? Okay. So the water wants to get in because the proteins can't make it out so it's trying to dilute it down. You can actually bust the tube open if you let it go long enough and that's kind of a fun thing to do too. All right. But what you've just done is you've gone from a mixture that had a large amount of small molecules with your protein to mostly just protein in a very small amount of those small molecules. So dialysis allows us to separate on a crude basis very big things from very little things like salts. Another technique that we might be interested in doing is separating molecules on the basis of charge. You've been seeing how protein charge can be altered by pH. It would be interesting to be able to separate proteins on, or separate things on the basis of charge. Okay? Well, this employs a technique called ion exchange chromatography. And ion exchange chromatography works in a column. You take a little tube called a column. You pour into it a mixture, a slurry of beads. Okay? And the beads have on them little tiny charges. Okay? So this particular column has negatively charged beads. Okay? When it starts out, the negatively charged beads have little sodium ions on them to counter that charge. Right? So when it starts out, I've got sodium linked to little tiny beads. Sodium just simply being a salt. I've got my column. I've got these millions of beads in this column. And now I apply my protein to that column. Let's say I've got a mixture of proteins. I've got some proteins that are negatively charged, some proteins that are zero charged, and some proteins that are positively charged. Which ones are going to stick to the column? Well, what happens, the positive. What happens is the positively charged proteins will kick off the sodiums. Okay. They'll kick off the sodiums and they'll stick, sit there and they'll stick to the, to the negatively char negative charge. Okay? 
What's going to happen to the negative charge proteins? Zip. They're not going to do anything. They're going to go right through. The zero charge proteins, zip, right through. Maybe not quite as fast as the negatives, but nonetheless. The positives are going to come out last. And you say, well, why do the positives come out? Any thoughts? Why do the positives come out at all? Yeah? You are flushing it with some stuff. You're typically uh, running some buffer through it, which will have some sodium ions and so forth, for example. So you're saying it kicks off the sodium ions. Are the sodium ions going to kick off the proteins? The answer is, yeah. How or why? Any thoughts? Yeah. What's that? The negative spots get filled up. Well, that happens too, but that's not why the positives come off. OK, this is an important lesson. And the important lesson is this. An ionic charge is not a covalent bond. If we don't have a covalent bond, we have things that are capable of coming off. And in fact, at any given time, they come off, they come on. They come off, they come on. They're going to spend more time on than off, but there's going to be a small percentage of the time they're going to be off. And when they're off, guess what sodium does? Sneaks in. Sodium sneaks in. Somebody just took your seat in the movie theater. You can't sit down, right? You're going to go look for another seat. And that's what that protein is doing. It's going to, in fact, move. And so over time, the positively charged protein will come off because that is not a covalent bond. I'm going to come back to that, that uh, thought later in the term. Okay? The positively charged protein is not, coming, is not staying there because it's not making a covalent bond with the bead. All right? So things that don't make covalent bonds, we have an on-off phenomenon. You're shaking your head. Is that confusing? OK, taking it in. OK, that's good. <laughs> Questions about that? Are you looking for the retention time to tell what kind of protein it is? Probably not. This is kind of a crude method for separating positive versus negative charge. You can imagine that the most positively charged ones will stay the longest, so there is that, but it's really hard to do much more than that. Okay? We could also have, and by the way, what I just described to you is called cation exchange chromatography. There's two different types of ion exchange chromatography. This one's called cation exchange chromatography. And it's called cation. Cations are positively charged things because what's being exchanged is a positively charged sodium ion. Yes, ma'am? It will, but let me come to that, OK? So, so everybody understand why this is called cation exchange chromatography? So the positive sodium ion is being exchanged. It's not the negative B that gives it the name. It's the ion that's being exchanged that gives it the name. Well, what she's asking about here is, well, what if I had a positively charged bead? How would that work? I think that was your question, essentially, right? OK. How would that work? Well, if I had a positively charged bead, I would have a negatively charged counter ion. Most likely something like chlorine, or chloride, not chlorine, chloride, right? So I'd have chlorides out there, and I pass through my mixture of proteins, which ones are going to stick? The negative ones, right? The negatively charged proteins will stick, and the chloride will be displaced. And just like with this one, the negatively charged ones will eventually come off as well. But they'll come out last. OK, so we can separate things on the basis of charge using ion exchange chromatography. Okay? Now, uh, there's another type of chromatography that I think is really cool and interesting. And it's really techy. And, and to be honest with you, it's not uh, an, a, as powerful as it might look. But it's going to look really cool. In the last one, I talked about pouring a column that had beads in it. And those beads had charges on them. This type of chromatography, which is called gel filtration chromatography, it's also called um, uh, molecular exclusion chromatography. By the way, you might wonder why the word chromatography. Okay? Chromatography. Why the word chromatography? Chromatography, chrome, refers to color. Okay? Are we separating things on the basis of color? Well, no, we're not. But in the old days, it turned out that people that worked with dyes 
had to have ways of separating the various dyes. So the technique of separating things came to be known as chromatography because they were separating colored things. Kind of a cool story. Okay. Now, this type of chromatography, gel filtration or a molecular exclusion, they're, e they're equivalent, involves a bead, but instead of having charges, the bead has little tunnels through it. Little tiny tunnels. Now these beads themselves are very tiny. They're about a millimeter in size. They're very tiny. So you can imagine little tunnels going through there have to be pretty um, intricate, and they are. They're typically made by a chemical process. And they're made in such a way that the size of the hole for the tunnel, or the tunnels, each one usually has a bunch of tunnels, the size of the hole for the tunnels is exactly the same. The size of the holes for the tunnels is exactly the same. So if you now apply a mixture of proteins to this, some of the proteins are going to be small enough, they will fit into the little tunnels. Some will maybe have a little trouble getting into the tunnels, and some aren't going to fit at all. Okay? Let's imagine you go to the county fair. And let's imagine that you are eight years old, and you're going with your parents and with your grandparents. Some of you have heard this one before. I can see by your faces. You go to the county fair, and you start at one end with your parents and your grandparents, and you say, oh, wow, look at all those rides. I want to ride every single ride, right? When you're eight years old, that's what you want to do. Maybe when you're your age as well. I don't know, right? Well, if you're... I don't know, if you are, say, 30 or 40 years old, you've probably done this a few times. It's probably not the same excitement, but it's your kid, so you're kind of going to go there and be careful with them, right? Grandma and Grandpa probably don't want to lose their Metamucil or whatever it is that they would have, okay? So they don't want to ride, right? So you've got three groups. One group is going to hit every ride, Mom and Dad that are going to go in some of the rides, and Grandma and Grandpa, which are going to watch from a distance, right? If we measured the speed with which they walked across that county fairgrounds, which one would get across first? Grandma and Grandpa. They're not going to go on anything. They're going to get across, right? What's that? <laughs> but they've got to ride the rides first. You see, riding the ride is going to be a slowing, a slowing down factor, right? The more rides you, run, you, you ride, the, slower it's going to, the hard, longer it's going to take you to get across. The more tunnels you go through, the longer of a pathway you're going to take through that column, the smallest guys are going to come out last. The medium guys are going to come out in the middle, and the biggest guys are going to come out first. They're not going on any of the rides. So gel exclusion chromatography separates on the basis of size. The ones that can't fit in there, and by the way, those things are called the exclusion limit, those whole sizes. They're a very specific size, and you can get ones that have different sizes. Things that don't fit in that exclusion limit are going to come shooting right through. And everybody else is going to come at varying rates, depending on how many rides they go, they go on. Okay, questions about that? Do the bigger ones block? No, they don't. Okay? Because they literally just bounce off of it. They, they go there and that's, that's that. So they, they don't block, no. If you put in, I guess, a really pasty mixture, then it might block on that basis, but not on the basis of the, the beads themselves. It just would have a harder time passing through the column. Okay. Well, perhaps we should take a slight break. Would you guys like to sing one? Okay, you know the rules. You gotta sing it loud or Kevin will be angry. Okay. So let us go. This is to the tune of an old Woody Guthrie song called This Land is Your Land. I hope you guys take some heart in this. It's one o'clock and Ahern's talking, Henderson and Hasselbach and PKAs and Buffers I should know. This song's for BB450. I hope that maybe he'll think the way we wrote our answers wasn't crazy. I really need the partial credit, so 
This song's for BB450. It's really groovy that it improves me. Watching lectures and quick time movies. I really need to go and download those podcasts for BB450. I'm feeling manic. I'm in a panic. I'd better study my old organic. It has reactions that I need to know. This song's for BB450. I know he said it, that's why I dread it. Cause I skip Fridays, extra credit. Twill probably haunt me, that lowly zero. Great in BB450. It could be steric or esoteric. That carbons get so anomeric. I'm too hysteric, better let it go. This song's for BB450. Okay, good enough. All right, that was better, but I still didn't hear enough of you guys and I heard too much of me. <clears throat> okay, so we've talked about some different types of chromatography, right? There's a, yet another one that's important, and this other type of chromatography is one that is, I think, one of the most powerful, all right? This also uses beads, but the beads here are designed in a very special kind of way. All right? They don't have charges on them. They don't have holes through them. They have things that have been attached physically to them. What are the things? Well, let's think about an example. Let's say that I am working on a protein that binds to ATP, and I'm interested in all the proteins of a cell that bind to ATP. I know it binds to it. I've studied it. I want to have a way to pull these proteins out of a cellular soup. Everybody with me? What do I do? Well, I take the bead. I physically attach it to ATP so that out here I have ATPs sticking out. I may have thousands of these sticking off of these beads. ATP is sticking out there. What happens when I place a mixture of proteins on the top of this column? Well, those that bind to ATP are going to grab a hold of ATP. Those that don't bind to ATP are going to come shooting through the column, and we're set. I've separated the proteins that don't bind ATP from those that do. My question to you is, how do I get my proteins off the column? What do I have to add? More ATP, right? On, off, on, off, right? Comes off, ATP replaces it. So if I want to get my stuff off the column, I replace it with ATP. This type of chromatography is very, very powerful. Let's say you're studying a, a molecule that only one protein in your cell binds to. You just found a way to separate your protein from all the thousands of other proteins in that cell by using this technique. This technique is called affinity chromatography. Question? Why do you need the beads at all? Why can't you just have ATP? Well, you got to attach it to something. I know. So why can't you just have ATP in there and then pour all your proteins in and find like you're binding to the ATP? You're talking about, I'm not sure, where, where, where would the ATP be attached? They can't exist just floating around like the second cylinder? I can have it floating around, OK? But then all I would do is the proteins would bind ATP, but nothing would stop the proteins from going on through, right? So the fact that I've got beads that aren't going through, the beads are immobile. They're sitting there, right? So the proteins, when they link onto those beads, are sticking there. If I put ATP, just ATP in there and didn't have any beads, the proteins would say, thank you very much for the ATP. We'll get our way out of here right now. Make sense? There's mud. OK. Make sense? Getting right through, cutting through the stuff like butter. This is good. All right. Um, another chromat chromatographic technique is a little higher tech. And it has uh, an acronym HPLC. And yes, you can call it HPLC. You're allowed to call things in this lab by any abbreviation that I use, as long as you get the abbreviation exactly right. So if you call this guy HLPC, I'm not going to give you credit. Okay? But HPLC is perfectly fine. HPLC stands for High Performance Liquid Chromatography. And no, you don't need to know that, but I'm telling you. Sometimes you'll hear labs call it High Pressure Liquid Chromatography. 
because it uses high pressures. But the, the technical name is high performance. All right. This guy really works not on the basis of charge, not on the basis of affinity, but, but more so on the basis of non-charge. That is, it separates on the basis of polarity, not charge. Separates on the basis of polarity. The more polar something is, the more different it will behave compared to something that's nonpolar in this system. So this involves columns as well. It involves very, very densely packed, little, much tinier beads. Very, very almost, almost dust-like beads. Those dust-like beads, for the, for the type of chromatography I'm getting ready to tell you about, have long, nonpolar fatty acids sticking off of them. So I got a little dust bead, essentially, that has long chain fatty acids, nonpolar things sticking off of them. I've got millions of these in here, and because they're packed very densely, the only way I can make things go through there is if I take a, uh, a, a pump that's able, capable of pushing things at very high pressure and physically pushing things through that column. These things may work at several thousand PSI, which is why they call it high pressure chroma liquid chromatography. Your material is dissolved in a liquid. Your material may have things that have charge, they may have no charge, or they may have a little charge. There's the big little middle, right? If I put them in there, what's going to happen? Well, the things that have charge will find nothing for them to associate with. They don't like those long nonpolar tails. They don't like the beads. So the polar things come shooting off quickly. If they're charged, even quicker. Things that have a little bit of polarity, like maybe they have an OH group or something like that, are going to associate some with the beads, but not as much as those that have no charge whatsoever. So with HPLC, using this, and there's different types of HPLC, the type I'm describing to you is called reverse phase HPLC. In reverse phase HPLC, the most polar things come off first, the least polar things come off last. Yes? Are charge and polarity going to be directly linked? The more, if something is charged, you can think of a charge as an extreme case of polarity. The more charged it is, the more likely it's going to come off fast. Yeah. Okay, so HPLC allows us to separate things on the basis of polarity, essentially. The least polar things will come off last. In this case, the least polar molecule came, was number one. The most polar molecule was number five. Okay, moving along. Yes, Stephanie. Can measure the amount of proteins or does it let you actually collect them? Good question. So, so this, does this allow you to just measure them or collect them? It turns out this is a, oh, sorry, sorry. This is a very powerful technique for collecting them. Because what happens is this guy shoots it through this column, it goes through a detector, and then from the detector it drips out into a tube. So once you say, oh, there's the thing I want, you put the tube under there, and then when it's done, you pull it out and you got it. The pressure doesn't affect the protein. The pressure does not affect the protein. That's right. And by the way, this is used for proteins. It's, out, it's more commonly used for very small things. So very small things, not proteins. Amino acids, for example, you can separate reasonably well here. Yes, ma'am. How do you know you're getting the protein that you want? Okay. A very good question. Okay. I got I see a peak. All I see on that thing is a peak. How do I know that's my protein? Right? That's your question. How do you think you would know that? It's a very good question. What's that? What do you mean by saying test with a pure substance? Oh, okay, so she's talking about a running standard. So let's say we were separating, I used to work on vitamin A. So let's say I put vitamin A in there and I put vitamin D in there and I take a standard. I say, I know this is vitamin A and I see where vitamin A comes out and where vitamin D comes out. So when I see something coming out at 
10 minutes and it's vitamin D, and I see something coming out of five minutes as vitamin A, when I do an unknown sample, I'd be reasonably uh, assured that the five minute was more, much more likely to be vitamin A than anything else. But that's part of the answer. But for a protein, you've got a different issue. And that's why I like her question. It's a very good one. This is an important thing to think about. When we go purifying proteins, we don't know unless we know what the protein itself does. Let's say that I knew, for example, that my protein, to go back to what I was talking about before, binds ATP. I take a mixture of proteins, I mix, mix them through here. I take every peak that comes off. I collect that one, I collect that one, I collect that one, I collect that one, I collect that one. And I could individually run each one through a column and ask the question, does it bind to a column that has ATP on it? I would be measuring a known activity of the protein to help me identify, is this the one that I'm after? It might be that I know my protein catalyzes a particular reaction. I give each one the molecule that I'm interested in and ask the question, did the reaction occur? I have ways of measuring that, okay? So whenever I purify a protein, I've got to have some way of knowing which one's mine because there are thousands of proteins there and those thousands of them are not mine. Okay. Other questions? Good questions. Okay. So that's HPLC. I want to talk about one more chromatography technique and then we'll go, maybe even a little bit early. <clears throat> Actually, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll make, I'll make it even simpler. Okay. I'm going to talk about a technique called gel electrophoresis. Okay. How many of you guys have run gels? Oh, yeah. Everybody's run gels. You run gels in high school now. Uh, back in my day, you know. Okay, back in my day, it was pretty unusual to run a gel. So a gel is simply a support, that's what it is. It is something that looks like jello, which is where I think it actually gets its name, okay? And you make it in a similar fashion. You have a compound that you uh, dissolve in water. One of the ways you dissolve it in water, if we're talking about agarose gel electrophoresis, is you take agarose, which is a polysaccharide, you put it in water, you boil it, it dissolves, and when it cools down, it forms this jello-like material. Don't eat it, you won't like it, okay? What that has is a network, a mesh, as it were, of things connecting each other, and those things that are connecting each other sort of half-heartedly hold water, which is why it has that sort of jelly-like property. Those things have holes. Those holes are like pores. And those pores are things that molecules can pass through. Now, if I take that gel and I cover it with water and I take my sample that in this case is a DNA molecule. DNA, by the way, has a phosphate backbone. It's negatively charged. Negatively charged. Many negative charges. I take and I apply my DNA mixture up here. They hit this mesh. What's going to happen? Well, the small guys are going to make it through very rapidly. Oh, by the way, we use an electrical field. Put a negative charge at the top and a positive at the bottom. So everybody, everybody is repulsed by that negative field. They get racing away from it. The smallest guys get away first because they can navigate this thing fastest. The larger guys can't make it quite so fast because, hey, it's hard when you're, when you're a little heavier. Okay? We separate these large molecules on agarose gel electrophoresis on the basis of size. Notice it's backwards from molecular exclusion. Here, the smallest guys are going fastest and the largest guys are going slowest. Okay, now, don't say I never let you out early. It's one minute before class is over. You're welcome. Hi, how you doing? Good. Um, I have a question with the HPLC. Uh huh. Um, you said that when they're most polar, they shoot off quickly, and when they're not, least polar shoots off fast. But yep. on, the, on the graph you showed, uh -huh. it seemed like the least polar were the fastest in minutes, and the most polar were the slowest. Or did I no. misunderstand that one? No, and like uh, the one with the, the red lines and, yeah. and things. Yeah. So, no. So the, mo the least polar, and there's different types of chromatography, uh, different types of HPLC. But in right. reverse phase, what I said is exactly right. Okay. Yeah. Wait, are we 
Oh. Okay. Right. So, sorry. Hi, do you have a question? Yeah. Um, I, I didn't get what you said. If you, uh, if you have ribonuclease and if you mix it with Marcoptoethanol. Yep. Hey, John. As opposed to like, not having Marcoptoethanol outside. Yes. What? So this was related to when it was when, it, when I was la allowing it to refold again. Oh yeah, that's right. Okay, so that's where it was. It wasn't during the the, the heating process. It was during the refolding process. So if I add a little bit of mercaptoethanol during the refold, I get more activity. And the reason is because it keeps those wrong disulfide disulfides from forming. If they form, they can break and then reform properly. Keep those wrong disulfide bonds from. Okay. Makes sense? Yeah. Good for you. I got, I, I got um, everything, <laughs> or I understood like everything that you said about, you know, how bad it Oh, wait, okay. I also had a question. Okay, well, let's get out of their way here. Do you mind coming back with me? Sure. Sorry. John, the, the sound system is all screwed up, so don't even bother with it. Okay. If, you, if you even turn the volume on without even turning the microphone on, you're going to get noise. I did, so I used the, yeah. the Madonna one this morning, and it seemed okay. Oh. I, before I even turned the microphone on, there was noise coming out of the speakers, and they said there's some problem with it. So, yeah, good. Well, you can try it, but good luck. Yeah. Um, Hi. How you doing? Good. How are good you? Good to see you. Yeah, you too. Yeah. What's going on? Um, not much. I have a W on my transcripts from when I was enrolled in oh. biochem last fall, but uh -huh. I was in Spain. Uh huh. And so, um, can I bring by a slip for you to sign? I'll, I'll take a look at. it. How about that? Okay. Okay. Sure. Did you have a question? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. Just real quick, please. Yeah. For ice cream. For SDS page, you normally just would take the challenge out the parts you wanted. I'm not sure I understand what the question is. 